All right, we got uh, the big three, Missouri wrestling, high school coaching. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we got Mike Haggerty, Gary Mayab, Bob Glasgow. These guys have had a lot of success in coaching. Look them up if you don't know who they are. Um, and we just want to get them on here to talk about coaching in general and, and what made them successful, what made their team successful. So uh, just so we're not all talking over each other, I'll just go Hag, Mayab, Glasgow in that order, all right? Um, just want to ask them a few simple questions. So the first question I was going to ask is, overall, when you were coaching, what was your coaching philosophy? Coach Hag? Um, yeah. My coaching philosophy was pretty, pretty much in place. Um, when I first started coaching in college, way back when, uh, down in Central Missouri, and uh, at that point, you know, I jumped into the game. I was very young. Didn't know. I don't think I really had a true philosophy. Uh, it was more just kind of like, whatever. And, you know, we just get guys in the room, practice, and then go wrestle competition. But uh, you know, it didn't take long to understand that you really do need to create a philosophy, uh, and and try to hold your your program accountable to that philosophy as well. So my philosophy was always to teach our athletes and student athletes to become their own best coach. And that simply means that you're with them, you know, two hours during the day probably, and uh, that you can get the best out of them. They're like, you know, they're gonna work hard. Very few guys are gonna come to the practice room and not work hard. But what really makes a difference, obviously in their life, is what they're doing those other 22 hours. So my philosophy was always to help our guys become their own best coach because they've got to ultimately make decisions. Uh, it takes a lot of guidance. It takes, you know, your freshmen and sophomores uh, a lot more direction. But by the time they're juniors and seniors, you hope that they've uh, kind of taught themselves to become their own best coach too. So that was mine. Coach Mayab, what about you? Um, you know, I think... I know that uh, I can't tell you how many conversations Hag and I had over the years at night, just uh, back and forth on, on getting ideas or what our philosophy ended up becoming. But I think that, you know, probably the biggest one for me is just that I tend to be a structuralist. I want structure. Um, it's just the way that I operate. Um, and I, I, I've always said that I, I'm not the best coach for everyone, uh, but for certain types of athletes, uh, especially ones that, you know, we always made a big deal of the upset and so creating the upset. And um, that's uh, kind of one of the things I strive to do with, with our athletes, trying to get them to be ready to do that kind of a thing. Um, the philosophy overall then would be build the box. And like Hag said, you know, it's as freshmen, sophomores, there's probably a lot more guidance there. I know that visually for me, it's kind of like walking through a field of, of athletes that are like sitting down, I envisioned, and then they've got their hands up. And the ones that got their hands up, I'm grabbing their hands and, and walking forward. And what I hope to have happen is that they walk past me and take off running on their own. And at the end of the day, that's expanding the box. And so I always thought about how good a box are we building? Are we putting one that is fun fundamentally and foundationally sound. And if that box is strong enough, then, then at some point we just want the athlete to expand the box and hopefully blow the box up. And um, luckily we had a few athletes that were capable of doing that. Uh, but for the most part, you're, you know, you know, as you guys as coaches, I mean, you're coaching to an 80%. I've always thought there was 10% of the athletes that were the gifts to us. <laughs> hopefully I couldn't even jack them up, you know, and then, 10% of them, no matter what we do or how good a training environment we create, they're just going to be a part of the team. And, and, and that's kind of where we wanted to go. And so it was about building a strong box and then, and then expanding the box. Um, always based on the thought of growth, though. And so as I close, I, I just say that the thing that we, I always wanted to see is I, every once in a while it would get caught on a photo, but I always loved those moments where the athlete says, you know, I just, I cannot believe I just did that, okay? And, and when they look at you, that's, the, that's what they're saying, so. Yeah. Coach Glasgow, what about you? 
Uh, first of all, I just got to say that Mayap's picture got a lot better <laughs> in the last few seconds. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Dort. Hey, Bobby. Uh, hey, guys. Hey. My uh, my expert, my philosophy was was basically I was a pirate. I stole everything I could from Coach Sears, my high school coach, Coach Collins, my college coach, friends and family and anybody else and, and picked apart things that I thought were good for me. Hell, I watched a, uh, when I was in high school, I watched a, some tennis pro talk about visualization. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. And I, that was a part of it. Just stealing whatever I could steal to help me build a program. And then that program get built on appropriate expectations for each level of kid. If it was the youth program, they had a set of expectations and you followed those expectations. And kids, I believe, will reach the expectation that you have for them as long as it's appropriate. You can't tell a kid that's, that wants to be on, just to be on the team that someday he could be a four-timer. He, he, he just wants to be a part of something. That, and those kids are important, too. So I always felt that if I had four kids in every class, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, four kids, I would always have a pretty damn good team. So I graduate four that were studs. I've got you know what 12 more coming in so and then I have another four freshman classes as long as I could keep four really good wrestlers the rest I could build around with whatever else came in and those four those actually those 16 wrestlers total would make your other kids better so my expectation level was trying to be appropriate for each kid and then then when I always tried to apply three rules or three principles What's best for my individual, what's best for this team currently, and what's best for this program overall. Program Trump, everybody else, team, individual, they were in there. But I, if I could apply a question or a discipline or, or what a situation occurred for, for a wrestler, I'd ask him, what's best for this team, what's best for this program, what's best for you? And if I could answer two out of three of those were the same goal or the same answer, then that was the way I needed to go with with whatever the situation was, if that made sense. Yeah. You guys all had success. Um, even though I think you guys all are kind of different styles, working with different style of kids too, throughout your high school coaching careers. But what stood out to you, I guess, what is kind of your building blocks, your list of four or five things that you thought were the most important things you did to building up your program? Coach Hag. Uh, four or five things. Uh, I think, you know, listening to these guys, it's funny because so much of what I obviously try to do, uh, we did have a lot of conversations, as Coach Mayab said, uh, bled over. And, uh, you know, like Bob's idea of having um, the team, the program, and then the individual. That, that was certainly a big part of how we approached it as well. Um, so as far as the alignment of how we kind of construct the things or what I think it takes to build a real program, the first thing is vision. Um, when I came to Blue Springs, our vision was in five years, we would have a state championship team. And we fell short on the fifth year, we were second. We ended up being second. And then on the sixth year, we won it. But so I think vision really sets the tone and it drives everything else. So vision is first. Um, and I, I think the other thing too, uh, number two would probably be uh, very close to that would be aligning yourself with very capable people, uh, people that are somewhat like-minded, but not afraid to challenge your authority or to step up and say, hey, I think maybe we ought to go in another direction with this particular situation. But you definitely have to have driven people at the top so i that's probably number two to me um number three which i think is really overlooked in the coaching areas is um communication i think you have to be a good communicator i believe that um across the board great programs are built around great communicators and you know i know both gary's program incredibly successful bob's program incredibly successful and they both are great communicators. They just communicate maybe a little bit differently, but they're, you know, guys that I can think of those two and hundreds of other really good coaches. And ultimately they have a way of communicating with their administration, communicating with their athletes, their parents, 
et cetera, et cetera. So communication would probably be number three. Uh, number four would be to work inside your wheelhouse. And that just simply to me means that you find those areas that you are probably the best at and you spend the majority of your time and effort in those areas. Uh, the other areas that you're not so good at, you can always farm those out. There's people out there that are willing to step up and help you. So um, I tended to struggle with that one a little bit because I would try to do some things that probably I wasn't really good at and I should have farmed them out over the years. And I look back at that now and realize that, that was an issue for me, but I tried to spend as much time in what I did well with the program and then the other guys could do the things that they did best in other areas. And then um, lastly, which I, it certainly probably isn't last on the list, but it's, it's number five. And that is to put your athletes in successful situations in all areas. That means from the very beginning in the practice room, they have to find some success as a freshman. They have to find success with certain techniques. You can't have kids come in, and to, especially in today's world, and get the tar beat out of them and expect to, for them to come back with a good attitude. Or even if they get beat, after you've taught them to shoot 20 times, they get beat 20 times, they're ultimately going to say, why am I doing this? But it goes a little bit bigger for me than that. It's like, I know for my own son with Keenan, you know, we worked really hard on just exposing him to great people. And these two guys are two of the very best. And they, my son spent a lot of time hanging around Bob and, and you know, certainly Gary uh, and a lot of other coaches and putting him in the environment. Got a little lag. Well, I, I, a lot of it, I mean, again, what, what Bob said about program is, you know, everything that we did was, was program-based, um, and the athletes knew it. I mean, we were, you know, luckily I got through my whole career without having to wrestle off, and that was, you know, one of the things that was just based around the thought that we're going to make decisions based on program, team, individual, and individual's third. And, uh, but Hag brings up a great point. If the individual's not um, brought into it and given some success somewhere, probably going to walk, you know, not, uh, wrestling's hard. We know that. So I think that, you know, for me, it was based around three things, um, you know, people, environment, and reload. Uh, Bob touched on reload earlier. Just, you know, I think a good coach that's building a program, you know, I learned an awful lot of lessons from him. Some of them were pretty tough lessons in his gym. So, um, but a lot of good ones there. We went down one time and, and we won two matches. We had a pretty good team, I thought. I thought we had a really good team. And um, we won two matches. The two matches you won were two against two of our better kids. <laughs> well, and, and right, but it was two of our – I mean, it was all, yeah, the state champions that, that, the, that all those four kids uh, all right. had won, pretty impressive. And, and uh, you know, and you, you win, and we win by one point on each of them. And you're like, okay. You know, so you go back, you learn a lot. Um, but no, I, people, environment, and reload. I think that the, the bottom two for me is people. I mean, it all starts with people. And if we're going to build that box, we'll build a house, then, then we want to build a, a, a good foundation and get the house built so we can bring athletes into the house. And, and that, that takes the job of the coaches, the, the volunteers, the support staff, and the parents. And if we don't get that built, then – you, you can't house and you cannot develop success, I believe. It's all going to be centered around the athletes in the end, but the athletes, I think, has to come second in that, in that process. So it's people first, and, and that's going to be, first of all, dealing with all your coaches and getting them online. And, and, and like Hag said, I mean, so much of it, uh, there's things that I, I always had person on my staff that would give me the look. They didn't have to tell me no. They just had to be strong enough to give me to look like I'm giving them an idea. And they kind of look at me like, I don't know about that one. And I, I needed that. And because I'm going to come up with a lot of ideas and then some of them just, they're not going to work. And, and somebody else sees that, but maybe I didn't. And um, so my number two on people is the athletes and the alumni and the alumni coming back. I think that I, I know that for us, I mean, I, I think the thing that, I'm most proud of in my life is just that we have over a hundred 
former athletes that are coaching now at different levels. And I, I, I just can't think of anything that would be, uh, to me, I mean, that's, that's the give back and that's that last part. So people first and, and those two are starting with staff and support and, and then athletes and alumni, and those are one. And then, and then finally we get into environment. And I think that I, I was very fortunate to, to work at schools. Uh, I worked at one school for one year. And uh, the reason why I did that is because the environment, the environment wasn't, it wasn't good. And I worked, I worked as hard at going 0 and 10 as anybody. And yet it didn't matter. And, and the football coach at that school ended up coaching, head coaching twice in the NFL and is the highest paid defense coordinator. So, and, and he went 0 and 10 in football. So I think that, you know, um, the basketball coach, I think he won three games. I think he was three and 27 or something like that. And, um, you know, so environment, I know that, um, I know that Bob built something very special. Um, I, I don't know that, uh, uh, and, and he did it in a way that I, I don't know. I, I know that, that both these guys did things that I don't think I could have done. I know that Hag held together teams that, and, and made them champions. And I don't know I could have done it with my way of doing it. And I know that Bob in his first year, I, I, I can't imagine, I know that, He's a year younger than me, and Hag's like ten years older than me. So, um, <laughs> but, but I think that I'm back on this call. Yeah, by the way, he's back, so. <laughs> I thought you were still frozen. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, you're not in Colorado right now either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm closer. And so, environment though, if you're in a good environment in, in in the schools that I was fortunate enough to work at, I mean, you you start out at Excelsior and and those people back then, I mean, my goodness, you walked in that gym, they wanted everybody to fail. If you were coming in a different color, they were united in that. And I'd never seen anything like that. And so, um, and being able to work with my high school coach, uh, Ralph the Bat, I know that uh, getting a chance to work with Hag in college and then turn around and my next jobs with my, my high school coach, it was like a dream. And so I think that environment's huge. Uh, the the school itself, the community. I mean, when you have football coaches that um, come to your events and you're at their events and, and it's a community, that's magic. And it's really hard to, you, you can only expand the wrestling world so far. And uh, we were fortunate enough that wrestling became an important part of both the schools that I'm mainly tied to. And so that was, um, and then the fourth one is just expanding that competitiveness that competitive environment. So the first two slots are about people and next two are about environments. And so I know that um, one of the lessons that Bob taught me was that, he, you know, in his dual schedule, he had three teams that were non-conference and correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought it was Oak Park, uh, Blue Springs and Lee Summit. And, um, you know, he would wrestle those teams and, you know, they were all large class schools and, um, you know, so by the time they got to uh, their conference district, uh, those guys, they had already defeated major wrestlers. So I think at that time, I think that he took a page that I said, I've got to find ways of expanding the environment that my athletes are in. And so, you know, we, we started going to things like we take nine to 10 of our freshmen, sophomores to, uh, uh, to Chicago every year for cadet world team trials knowing that they might get slaughtered a little bit, but by that time getting them there and that was, we call our boys men to, you know, and so it just things like that. And then, so those two are environment. And I think environment's critical that you build one that's a good training environment for athletes and that they want to go out and do things at home. I think that home duels, if you can make a great environment, that's pretty special too. And the last one is just, you know, lifelong learning and relationships. I, I know that I, I try to learn something every single day of my life. And I know that uh, I'll stay up later, get up early if I have to, 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 to learn something that day. And so I want to get better each day. And, and I hope that we've uh, set up a program that, that did that for athletes. Uh, because at the end of the day, you have to be able to reload. And so last part of this, just lifelong relationships. Uh, two of my I was in an interview and they asked me what, what my favorite memory was at the state tournament. 
And it just so happened that both of them were on the call with me. You know, I mean, watching Bob win a title that was pretty closely contested, I believe, and his son doing it, I thought that was uh, that was one of my best moments I've ever seen. And then watching Hag and, and Greco both coach sons uh, in their program and then win titles, I think that those are two of my favorite moments. And obviously God was good enough to give me three girls. So uh, <laughs> that, would, that wouldn't have changed anything in today's world, but at that point it did. So it was good. Yeah. Coach Glasgow, what about you? What are, what are your keys? Well, I tell you, Coach Evan, you've put me in a huge disadvantage following those two guys. I mean, they cover <laughs> such a wide you know, spectrum of, of what, the, what you do to build a program. It, you know, I have a little, maybe I'll say some of the same things but in a different way. And, and, you know, the respect that you have. Gary and Mike and I fed off each other. Uh, we fed off of Mike Jeffries from Helias. We fed off the guys that had success in the past, and we wanted to reset a bar. And anybody who tells you that the head coach that's successful isn't, doesn't have an ego and isn't driven is, is that guy is an idiot. And that, that coach isn't going to win very much. Um, you have to be driven. You have to have an ego. You, you have to, to step up and say, I, I want these things and get your kids to buy in. And that's where I, I, I segue into trust and buy in is, is huge. Your kids, your parents, your administration, um, from from every every aspect of the program, in any which way you dire any direction you reach, there has to be trust and buy-in, and and whether that be in the, your discipline issues, your your competition, your as Gary said, I, I truly believe that you had to set you were only as good as the people you practiced with, only as good as the people you competed against. So you had to build a good structure and environment, as Gary talked about. Um, and then that had to be the second part of that would be it have to be comprehensive that needed to be done from the youth program up and and so you had to get alumni dads who were committed and wanted to learn as much as you knew as much as you could teach them and hand those same technology or techniques and phrases and philosophies from the time the little kid five-year-old stepped into the wrestling room until he graduated from high school they heard the same things and had the same expectations. Again, appropriate expectation level. Um, and then as a coach, you, you had to walk the talk. If you, if you told a kid he needed to be at the Blue Springs Freestyle Tournament or uh, the Fight or Flight Tournament or whatever, or Fargo or back then in Cedar Falls when we were going there or to the World Team Trials, and even though it was – if Greg Stahl hears this, they'll know that we cheated. We drove kids to those tournaments, you know. <laughs> uh, you, you have to be able to walk the talk and put time in yourself. You're asking kids to put in time in. You as a coach have to put time in, and kids have to see that, and that's where the trust is built. Um, and, and, and that walk the talk is also give kids an opportunity to be successful. You know, I, I talk about you're only as good as the people you compete against, but you can't have that kid get pounded every time. He's got to have some success. So in our position, I was probably in the best of all worlds. We were good enough that the, the Oak Parks, the Blue Springs, the Lee Summits, uh, the, the Raytown South tournaments, the, all the, any tournament we wanted to get in or any duel that we could get into and met on the schedule, we were good enough. People respected us and would let us have that. But I didn't have to do that every single night like the gold division and the suburban conference does now. I didn't have to have an A game every night. We could go, we could drive to Carrollton and be done in a duel in 22 minutes and have to drive an hour and a half back home. So those aren't the, you know, it was a good deal. We could train through those things. We could work on things. I didn't have to have Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday crank and have an A game every time. So that made it a little easier to forget kids to trust because they believed in what we were doing. And then the last thing is, 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 in all situations, be firm, fair, and consistent with your kids, with your parents, with your administration. And just if you're firm, fair, and consistent and apply the rule, all the rules, all the disciplines, all the philosophies to every kid, whether it be Matt and Franca or Rusty Goddard, they knew that they, what, if they did something wrong or they did something right, they were going to be treated the same way. Me and Jesse have a few lightning round questions for you guys. Just top of your head or think about this, but you guys have all coached the list of guys you've coached is insane. Obviously it's like a who's who of Missouri, but uh, 
who is the most talented guy you've ever coached? Just pure talent at a high school level. Coach Hag, what do you got? God, man, that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> just pure, pure talent. Oh, man. I, I, a guy that just stood out with just amazing talent. Uh, he definitely had some some hiccups in his in his repertoire, right? Um, but just sheer talent. Might have been a guy that isn't doesn't stand out with a lot of people's names, but Tyler Thompson. You know, just sheer talent in the room. What he could do, um, his ability to change levels, his uh, athleticism, reaction reaction time, and speed. He was he was a state runner up. And, um, but he was a great kid, worked hard, you know, and I still respect the heck out of him. But it's funny you ask that question that way, just pure talent. Um, that's one that really stands out in the back of my mind. I might come up with somebody else, but um, that one in particular, I think. Yeah. Coach Mab? I've been fortunate to, but I, I, I don't know if I can separate these two, but Zach Bailey and Ricky Williams, I think that, they're both they're they're both older brothers, but and and the gardeners are right there with them. But I just you could take either one of those two guys and throw them up in the air, and they're going to land on their feet. And it doesn't matter how you throw them; they're going to that's you know you could throw them, and they'd be looking at you in their stance, and you go, "Wait a second, I just threw you or something." So I think that I don't know those two to me they just stand out. I know that. Um, and, and, and the other thing is that just, you know, both of them dealt with injuries. I know that Zach dealt with, I think, a little bit more with that shoulder issue that he had where it kept coming out. Of, but, you know, to win, to be able to win and you're that hurt, um, you know, two of his four titles, I just, I was just blown away by. So it wasn't just a talent thing. It was also that he had the ability to do something with his, I mean, his um, sophomore year, I think was, he had he had an upper respiratory uh, uh, infection. He was he was in the emergency room at three forty five in the morning Friday night, and uh, and then he had asthma and he and he had asthma the whole time. And so uh, when you put on that type of upper respiratory infection with asthma, then that should be a, a done deal. And and for some reason, you know, he just came to me and said, "Please let me do this." And it was like everything in me said don't do this and it's a job loss issue you know and and yet he goes out and pulls it off somehow and and then um you know a senior year after he dislocated a couple of times and the shoulder and then turn around and come back and win the thing and i just that that just showed me how much talent he had so and ricky as well so that's it yeah. coach glasgow it, it's probably no surprise it matt and frank was the best kid overall wrestler that from all positions, all styles, folk style, Greco, freestyle. He beat kids that ended up being Olympians. He beat NCAA champions. He had his, – his ceiling was unlimited if, if we could have kept him focused. And, and I'm not so sure – Matt and I have had this conversation that, that him going to Nebraska was the best choice looking back. Hindsight's 2020. But um, he probably never should have redshirted. That, that he lost his focus a little bit. But, uh, but, not, but in high school, he was as good as his – I've ever coached and, and we had several good kids and kids that placed at Fargo and kids that ended up being NCAA All-Americans at, at different levels. So, but Matt, uh, how he beat the Valdavia Swiss, he beat Dwight Henson twice. Um, I mean, he beat a lot of really good people, beat Biff Walleiser. Beat, I mean, he beat kids that I'm like, wow, that's, uh, that's impressive. So Matt by far was, was the best and he didn't go undefeated for us for four years, but he was a four time state champ. In fact, that night that Gary won two matches, they beat Matt and Franco. So, but they beat him with Brett Williams, another pretty good kid. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, toughest kid you've ever coached? Just tough, gritty. Coach, Coach Hag? Wow, that's tough too because, I mean, you know, I'm kind of splitting hairs with some of this stuff with some of our guys. Um, just tough. Yeah, gosh, man. You know, Dom was pretty tough. Dom, Dom was a guy that, even though, I mean, he's got that soft, you know, really easygoing spirit, 
when it really gets ugly and he needs to get ugly, um, he's pretty damn tough. And uh, it's pretty hard to argue with a guy, you know, that um, is still on the Olympic ladder and, uh, and, and a junior world champion, all those things. But j just toughness. Uh, we took great pride in being tough. And we had some others like uh, Tyler Hubbard, for example, um, is another one. Tyler Hubbard, if, if most of these guys would remember this too, that Tyler was set up real well to win his uh, third state title and undefeated, third undefeated state title. And in the quarterfinals of the uh, Nash or the state tournament, he tears his ACL. And uh, everybody, and, and he did limp through it and got to Nobody would agree to let him go and wrestle because he was torn ACL. So we had to get some signatures and, you know, it was a real complicated thing to get it done, but we did, including his dad and, um, we, you know, signed off on the waivers and stuff that he was capable of wrestling. And, you know, the little stud went out and won the state tournament on a, on a torn ACL. Uh, fortunately, there was a gal there that was a trainer. Story was, is there was a trainer a uh, female volleyball player that had torn her ACL the year before, and she had a brace. And she said, Coach Hag, your microphones are going a little crazy right now. Sorry. It's, but we got you. I, Sorry about that. That's <laughs> my muted. Okay. But along the short of it is, Tyler won the state tournament his senior year with a torn ACL, and he won two and a half matches doing it. So it's pretty, pretty much a stud. Uh, okay. So... Again, we had a few other stories like that, so that's that, that I could, but I could lean on those two, I think. Sorry for cutting you off, Coach Hag. Coach Mayab? Well, I think I, I don't know. I, again, I'm going to miss some people. I, I already talked about Zach and that, but uh, I'd probably go all the way back to Eric Sapp. Um, he, um, he was undefeated at sectionals, regionals back when we had him, and uh, he's going to the state tournament he's undefeated he's a senior um uh, great athlete i i don't i i don't think that anyone pinned me in the room more than twice and he did because he would catch a cradle from almost anywhere and he just had big arms and once you got in it you weren't getting out and uh he's in a great match and he gets lifted and returned and as he posts his hand out he dislocates his elbow and I run out to him, myself and Coach Mandel, and we get out to him, and he is his arm is on the mat in a really weird, it's kind of a teed out position with his humerus. And um, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's four inches back. It's, his arm is so big, it's just pulled the bone back. And we get out to him, and he just looks right at us very calmly and says, Coach, put it back in. I'm good. Just like that. And I was like, okay, we're not doing that and we can't. And ended up, he had, he had surgery that night. I mean, they couldn't get it. They tried to get it back reduced a couple of times and, and they couldn't get it either. So they had to put him under and, and, and reduce it, but uh, with surgery, but I, I really, and, and then the other side of it is just, he comes right back to practice the following Monday with a sling on and he's just helping everybody else. And so just, I mean, I think that toughness, I mean, it has a resiliency to it. It's not just that you can take a punch. I mean, what, what Hag talked about with Tyler and that, I mean, it's people that are thinking warriors that even after they get injured badly sometimes, they just have the ability to, 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 to make light of it somehow and move forward. And I think that's what I'm always looking for when I think about toughness is people that can move forward after the – the bad punch has happened to you. So very impressed by him and, and several other young athletes that I've been fortunate enough to be around, but it's pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm putting you guys on the spot. Uh, Coach Glasgow? The, uh, the, the toughest, meanest, without a doubt for us, would have been Kevin Stanley. Um, <laughs> he, didn't do, he, did, he didn't overcome any injuries. He usually inflicted the injuries <laughs> and begged people to try to come back and – and continue to wrestle with him so he could break their other arm. But without a doubt, he was the meanest, toughest, 
most grinder that I ever coached. And uh, at times it was, you had to reel him in, in practice. So, I mean, he was, he was a bad frog. (laughs) Toughness standpoint of, of, of overcoming things like that. We had a kid named Rick Bender first round of the district tournament. He tears his ACL. He hangs on to finish the match. Trainer takes him. Patty Dingus, who's at Blue Springs South right now, she was our trainer at the time, and she's put him through this, her protocols, and she goes, well, it's, it's tour. And uh, Rick Bender, a Blue Springs grad, and went to high school with him. His dad, he says, well, what's that mean? And Dusty says, well, I, I'm going to wrestle. It can't get any worse, right? And Patty, the trainer, says, no, it's tour. It's gone. So she taped him up. We braced him up. And he fought from this first round loss and went all the way through and got third in the district tournament on, on a tour in ACL. And we defaulted him out after that. But uh, those kinds of things happen to a lot of kids. Tommy Lewis, the same thing. And the, the, last, the last go of the last practice of the year before we turn around and leave the next morning for the state tournament, he tears an ACL. I live next door to Dr. Gialdi. So I load Tommy up in my car, which is probably another MSHA violation. I load him up in my car and take him to the doctor. And uh, Dr. Gialdi says, well, he's got a Tory ACL. I said, son, you're done. Tommy says, I'm not done. I'm wrestling tomorrow. So we braced him up, and he throws a kid in a headlock first round of the state tournament, and he's going to pin this kid. There's no doubt in my mind. Referee, St. Louis side, stopped for potentially dangerous because it was too tight. And it was tight, no doubt about it. Kid's head was turning red, but turn the other way and get pinned if you want out of it, you know. Well, so now the kid's got to go down in, in referee's position. When we get through that position. We let him go. He, start, he grabs our hands. We're up 5-0 still. That kid chooses top on us. We can't get into referee's position. So at that point, it's just like he couldn't bend his leg to get into position. So we ended up having an injury default out, and that was – but he gave it a go, and who knows if we could have stayed on our feet, who knows what he'd have done. But he was ranked number one at the time, but he didn't get a medal. Hey, these Coach. Darn, uh, these darn refs, man, they're stopping these matches right when it's getting good. <laughs> Those refs. The, the one that I, I definitely missed was the ACL was, was Zach Joyner. I mean, that guy, he, he tears it his junior year up at St. Joe right before districts and then comes back the following year, and, and within a month of practice, he's torn it again. And, he just went through the season with it. And so, I, I, again, he got one of those kind of braces that Hag talked about. And, but just I'm, I've always been amazed at how tough young people can be. And, and, and that's not – there's so many things we can teach in wrestling, but that's not one of them. So, pretty no. neat. I don't want to keep no, you in today's for, world. Go ahead, sorry. Or today's world, our, our, our trainers won't let you do this stuff no, anymore. Right. They shut you down. And yeah. it's, I, I'm just like, really? Come on, people. It's, it's, it's already tore. What are we going to do to it? <laughs> uh, I don't want to keep you guys a ton longer, but I know Jesse had a couple quick ones for you too there. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you guys if you had like a all-time favorite match that stuck out in your head. It's like that's like the all-time favorite one that you've coached in. The answer to that for me is a no. I don't have a favorite. I honestly don't. I have several that really stand out. And, you know, it's like some of them would really honestly be matches that were average kids, but they happened to win a big match. And so for me to put a tag on, you know, we were fortunate like Gary and Bob and many other people to have some state champions, but um, those aren't, those are emotional. You're in the moment, but there are a lot of other matches that were probably less low key that to me, as I look back, mean more. So I'll just leave it at that. Coach Mab. Yeah, same kind of thing. I just, I, I know the kind of match I loved. I right. loved the match that with the upset, you know, the one where, you know, we pull it off. But I would also say that one of my favorite matches is a state finals match that we had the year before and won against an undefeated athlete. He came back, went up two weight classes to go after us, and he beat us. And I just – and the athlete that was the defending state champ had finished the match on his back, and that just – it haunted me, you know. But, again, we were talking about toughness, and the athlete came back to me and, you know, Ryan Gardner and said, Coach, that, 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 that I had to go for something. I was losing. And I thought – Man, uh, you know, you learn a lot of lessons from your athletes, and that was definitely one of them. And, and so uh, that was there. And then Dave Kelgar, 
I talked to him just the other day. He's down in Texas now doing very well and a uh, full blown adult that's uh, just family and everything's going great for him. But um, he got absolutely taken to the cleaners by international officials that they had set the, they had reset the order of the bout. Uh, a young man had, had uh, we were in um, uh, um in Sweden and uh, this, you know, if, if you know who Dave Kelgar is, he wrestled at OU, he's a great athlete, same kind of knee problems. But he, uh, he came back and, and, and we stayed late. They had rest, uh, weigh-ins and the young man he was supposed to wrestle from Finland did not weigh in that night. We come back the next morning and they said, well, we didn't think you were weighing in at night. So... They asked him, you know, do you want to let him wrestle? And he goes, I came all the way across the pond to wrestle. I want to wrestle this guy. And then they put three finished refs on the mat. And it was two of the most ridiculous calls I've ever seen in my life. And uh, he was 15 going on 35. He was calmer than I was. And he was, he was, he just, coach, that's, that's wrestling. And I was like amazed. So uh, there's, there's several matches, but like Hag said, it's not, you know, it's not about, that match or a different one. It's just what it kind of leads to emotionally for me, I think. Right. Glasgow. Uh, I, I've got two and then one of them I, or did, spoke about earlier. My one, Kelly, my oldest boy was able to pull off the state championship his senior year and was the heavy underdog in that match. He's wrestling green from Monad who was 43 and 0 and, we had like 10 losses or something and we get into the finals and we smoke him, um, attack him. If we didn't pin him, we ended up pinning him. So it was awesome. That clinched the team title for us. It was, it was just an awesome, the O's movie story type thing, you know? So, and the other one was uh, a state finals with another Oak Grove kid when uh, Travis crawl had won his first state title. Uh, he was down 11 to three going into the third and we came back and won 17, 14. And, uh, that was a roller coaster. And uh, that's a match that, that, that we still – some guys talk about that were on those teams and when Travis was wrestling about how that, you know, just two touchdowns and a field goal, we, we can come back from behind. So it was a, <laughs> it was a great match. But, again, the, the, the ones you feel most satisfied about are, are just like Gary and Mike said, were the, 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 the lesser-known kids that, that mm-hmm. you worked with and he finally – he hit those three moves in a row – to upset somebody that he wasn't supposed to and as you worked on those things and you had a had a had a hand in it and he he knew it you knew it and we all came together to have a great experience so those are the the most satisfying no. that's good the last one that i had for you guys was a, there was a uh, kid that you least liked to coach against because you knew he was going to be a he was going to be a tough out like every time that you were going to coach against him if that sticks out in your mind Wow. Um, well, let's face it. When you, when you meet those guys that, you know, like those, it's like, they're always there. You, you just like, whether it's one of Gary's programs or Bob's programs, and we see each other many, many times during the year. And, uh, you, you, you see them as a freshman and they beat one of your better kids. And it's like, Oh crap. I've got to see this guy another four years. It's like, (laughs) this is, this is not good. Uh, and, and trust me, we saw a lot of those in the Kansas City area between Park Hill, Oak Park, Staley, of course, and, and Oak Grove. And these schools like this, that was, that was pretty common stuff. So to pick one guy and to right. say was there that one guy, that nemesis that's out there. Uh, but, yeah, there were, there were a lot of those guys. that, And some of them, you know, created some really outstanding rivalries, though, too. Some, you know, whether it was like, Gary, when, when Elijah moved in and wrestled Dom, you know, that was, that was pretty amazing. You had the number one and the number two ranked heavyweights in the country within 30 minutes of each other here in Kansas City, and they were going to have to wrestle each other three or four times every year, minimum, sometimes more. So those are the kind of things that really that, – that builds, like Bob was saying, to me that builds the culture, though. You know, you hate it because, you know, God, are we going to have to see this guy again next week and next week? But uh, in the big picture, you know what it really does because it is like iron sharpening iron, and you know you're going to get better for it. 
but at the moment, it's like, man, this is going to be a long four years. <laughs> I, think, I, I think the same. I think that, uh, you know, I think those are the ones where I know that I had two athletes I can think about that one of them had six losses. And so we go to this tournament and uh, it, they're going to seed for districts. And at the time we had five of those losses and, um, and it was to one of Hag's kids. And it was like, well, you know, he's, he's got too many losses. And I'm like, he's got <laughs> losses to one guy. That's it. And, and our schedule's tough enough. We're going out of state and doing things that I'm telling you, this is not, don't, don't look at the win loss here. It's all to one guy. And so it's those kind of things that, yeah, it, it makes you think. And I know another one that was good was, uh, well, two of them that, that deal with guys on this call is one, we had to send people out after Stanley. So it was like, <laughs> you know, whoever's the last one out the door, you got him. So it, you know, and it was like, you know, <laughs> and I never thought about really throwing the towel in, but there was times where I was like, Gary, you could get arrested for doing this. You know, coming out after him. And, and, you know, you always, as a coach, you tell kids things like, oh, I wouldn't have you ever do anything that I wouldn't do. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to do that one. So, <laughs> you know, and, and, and then the other thing is, the last one is uh, Chinuma. <laughs> and and <laughs> we wrestled him, and, and I think he was a sophomore, and first coming up. And I told my athlete, I said, listen, you can take this guy down and you can let him up. And that's our style anyway. So just do that. But do not try to put him on his back. If you do, he's going to counter from his back. I've never seen anything. But it's like you could do a lot of things to somebody, but if you stuck him in that spot, there's like another switch went off or something. And so I just – I don't know that, that uh, you know, those kind of things. That, and, of course, my athlete did a great job, took him down twice and decided to turn him in half, and then it got bad. So, you know, it's like you think about those deals. and But – no, overall, just just expanding that box on those guys. It was good. Coach Glasgow? Oh, for me, it was easy. It's, it's Dustin Brewer. Bobby Lowe has 11 losses in his career in high school, and eight of them are to Dustin Brewer. Um, <laughs> many of them very, very close. One of them was not close, and that was the last one. Uh, I think Dustin was going to make sure he knew Bobby remembered that one. So uh, we always opened up with Oak Park. And Bobby played football as small as he was. And uh, so we would come out of state playoffs and deep into the state playoffs many, many years, all four of Bobby's years. And uh, hell, one of the years we're in the state finals. And we still, I made those kids come out and wrestle two weeks, 10 days to the day. 10 days we had Oak Park in a duel. And he had to go wrestle Dustin Brewer. That happened four years in a row. And then the very next week we go to the Lee Summit North Tournament and Oak Park and Oak Grove were there. And those were the two that were one, two seeds. And we were always the two seed. And, uh, and there was times I, I tried to dodge Dustin and Bobby said, no, I'm going after him. But that was part of that expectation level he had for himself, the, the culture that we, that we had built. He wasn't going to run. And, and to him, it was like, well, if I don't wrestle Dustin, everybody's going to say, I just went, I, I, I skirted him, you know? So uh, that always, that, that was always a good thing. And then I used that story to, to tell old later Oak Grove kids, you know, Hey, this is one of the reasons we wrestled up. We don't, he's not in our class. He's going to make us better. So, but yeah, Dustin was always going to be the tough out. And, and Brett Williams and Matt and Frank, I would have dodged each other all they wanted. Hell, they were good buddies. They yes. ran around together in the off season and, and went to tournaments together. And they, those guys could have called each other and said, Hey, I'm going 25. You go 30 in this duel, or I'm going 19. You go 25. And we're, we're not going to mess. They didn't dodge each other. They went after each other. And when it was over, they were back in the stands, unfortunately, sharing candy and sugar and all that crap instead of <laughs> doing what they were supposed to do. But, but, uh, but those, they were all Oak Park kids, you know. And, and Bobby, Bobby's other two losses of his 11, two of them came to Tyler Hubbard. So that was, those were always the, the, the bullets that we had to dodge, and you always tried to figure out a way to win that you dreaded trying to outcoach those kids, and they were tough. No. All right, I'll let you guys go. I really do appreciate you guys talking to Thanks, us, especially guys. for a long time. I appreciate everything you guys have done in wrestling and you're still doing. That's the thing. You guys are still involved, making an impact. And I really appreciate you guys a lot. So thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, guys. I enjoyed it. Hey, it's good to see you guys. Good to Absolutely. see you too, Coach. Good to see you guys, see you guys. too.